Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's the Ask Forum, Teaching Tomorrow, Unleashing the Power of AI in Education. It's so great to see the conversation already off and running in the chat. We have almost 2,000 educators, leaders, and interested participants from around the world joining us today. So welcome and thank you for joining us for the next hour. My name is Kelly Christian. I'm the Director of Strategy and Membership here at NEASC, and I'm joined by my colleague Trillium Hiblin, who has been the Associate Director for International Education for the last seven years and is our recently appointed new incoming Director of Education for our International Education Commission. Today, we're humbled to have our panel of five presenters with us today. They're representing uh, AI industry, media, the classroom, and school administration. They're joining us from China, the UK, Canada, and the United States of America. We'll let them introduce themselves in just a minute. Unleashing the power of AI in education is a huge topic. We recognize that it's gonna take a lot more than 60 minutes to address all of your questions, concerns, hopes, and interests. Uh, we're gonna do our best to address as many of them as possible, and we appreciate the hundreds of questions that were submitted ahead of time. Because we're all joining today at different levels of understanding, we are gonna start off by framing our discussion today with an understanding of the terminology and words that we're using. What do we mean when we talk about generative AI and non-generative AI? We'll try to get us up to a base understanding of the vocabulary and language so you can be a part of the ongoing conversation. Second, we know that on many of your minds, due to the 500 plus questions about this that were submitted ahead of time, that academic integrity is a huge topic for teachers and school leaders. We're going to address this directly, and then we're going to move on into a place that we hope can leave you with a growth mindset, in a place of hope, and a place where you feel equipped to take resources, uh, actionable items that you can take back, concrete takeaways into your classroom today and into your schools as soon as we finish this webinar. Uh, we know that this is just the beginning of the conversation, so we hope you'll stay tuned for the next NEASC forum information coming soon that will continue the conversation and dig deeper into AI in the classroom. Now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague Trillium to get the conversation started. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much, so Kelly. Kelly. We're going to start off by having our panelists introduce themselves. Andrea, would you like to get us started? Sure. Hi, everyone. I would say good morning, but it's different times for everyone at this point around the world. Um, my name is Andrea Schwamm. I am the assistant superintendent of the Wareham Public Schools in Massachusetts in the United States. I'm very excited to be here and talking about this very dynamic topic, and I'd like to turn it over to Tricia. Hi, my name is Trisha Friedman. I am a longtime educator who's had the great privilege of working and teaching across eight different countries. I am now currently located in Ottawa, Canada. I'm the founder of Alia.org, and I'm also the director of learning with Shifting Schools. We're supporting uh, educators like yourselves in thinking about the ways in which AI connects to all of the great work that we do in schools. And it's a great joy to be here with my fellow panelists. I'll turn it over to Stephen. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Stephen Taylor. I'm the Director of Innovation in Learning and Teaching at the Western Academy of Beijing. Um, it's my 20th year overseas. We're an IB World School. We're also a NEASC accredited school. And we've been exploring AI in education for a little while, but it really exploded in the last year or so. Um, and we're really thinking about how do we adapt in ways that can make learning continue to be joyful and hopeful for the future, but safe and ethical and inclusive too. And I'll pass it on to Priya. Thanks so much, Stephen. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I can see lots of friends in the chat, actually, um, who I've known for some time. I'm Priya Lakani. I'm the founder and chief executive of Century Tech. We've been building classical, traditional AI, which is non-generative AI for about a decade now, and um, working with schools across uh, over 60 countries. I sit on, I've sat on the UK government's AI Council, being a non-exec director of their department for digital, focused on online safety. Um, I helped write the regulation review paper in the UK, 
Um, and I sort of have lots and lots of, um, you know, fingers in lots of different pies in terms of the media and, and broadcast in terms of explaining artificial intelligence to general audiences and their application. I'm um, really excited to be here today and talk about how AI affects uh, education and cover some of those terms that Kelly uh, introduced a little bit earlier. And I'll turn it over to Nate. Hello, everyone. I, too, am thrilled to be here. My name is Nate Green. I am the academic technology coordinator at a private school in Washington, D.C. called Sidwell Friends School in the United States. And I've been teaching middle and high school students about AI for many years. And as others have said, um, the explosion these last couple of years uh, has been you know, exciting and challenging. And I'm excited to talk through it today with all of you. And I'll turn it back to Trillium. Great, thanks. It, I saw someone say that what a, what a panel of rock stars and, and I couldn't agree more with that. So we're gonna start off as Kelly mentioned with a little overview by Priya to talk about what do we, what do we mean when we say AI? As a few of you mentioned in your introductions, classical AI has been around for a while, but this generative AI, what do we mean by that Priya? And, and what are we talking about with some of these terms? I'm so happy that you asked that question because sometimes I'm in rooms with policymakers, you know, they're making big decisions for a country. And I think people are quite afraid to say, what is AI? <laughs> and so uh, they're then thinking about the future of the country and public services and actually um, there's no fundamental understanding. And so let's just go right back to basics. So everyone on this call, um, everyone here today can go away and actually explain AI to, uh, you know, their parents, their, their child, their neighbor. So, when we talk about AI, you'll hear terms like artificial intelligence and machine learning, and people use those terms interchangeably, right? AI is this kind of broader idea and concept of creating an intelligent machine. So a, a computer, a machine that can perform tasks without human intervention, right? And then machine learning, which you hear interchangeably um, in many, many sort of media broadcasts, is like a subset of AI. It's a technique. Right. How do you teach a machine to learn and then improve from data, from information? When we talk about data, we're just talking about data points, information points and experiences. And so that's sort of the idea of artificial intelligence and then machine learning. And then just a couple of other areas so that everyone's got the same sort of, you know, we're on the same page as to what we're talking about. You hear a lot of people talking about AGI, artificial general intelligence, right? They talk about the singularity. They talk about super intelligence. And then some people talk about narrow AI. Now, what we mean here is that all AI you see today, I promise you, okay, everyone will agree with me in the world, including um, people who are sort of fear mongering or talking about some sort of dystopian future. We all agree that today we only have narrow AI. That is essentially an AI that can perform one or a few specific tasks. They're designed for specific jobs. Say so the AI is designed to beat the grandmaster in chess, right? The AI that's designed to um, listen to you as you talk to Siri or Alexa and then respond to you. What we don't have at the moment is general AI, artificial general intelligence. The idea of AGI and super intelligence is an AI that can perform lots of different tasks, right? But the key is that it can learn new things and it can understand and adapt to new situations. So just to be really clear, the world is still in the narrow AI zone. We aren't at AGI right now. In the narrow AI zone, most popular applications use machine learning, this technique that I just covered a little bit earlier. And within machine learning, there is generative AI and non-generative AI. So the artificial intelligence that we've seen um, for well over a decade, transforming every sector in the world, the recommendations on your smartphone, telling you what to shop, you know, what to buy, what to watch in terms of movies, where to stay in terms of going on holiday, that and those recommendation engines, as well as the sorts of AIs to predict uh, you know, if somebody might um, have a disease, if there's tumours in particular scans, for example, to help radiologists in healthcare, the AI can spot um, your misconceptions in a particular subject as you're learning. That AI is non-generative AI. It's essentially built using patterns and correlations in data. And then all AI is doing is it's predicting what's the probability of Trillium doing well in something? What's the probability of Trillium health going in a certain direction, right? It's going to predict and essentially create a probability based on lots of data. And then generative AI, to, to sort of end on this note, because this is what's really captured um, the, uh, the masses in terms of attention. Generative AI is an AI that's been available really and been developed 
since the transformation in 2017, where Google wrote a paper on how to use a different type of model to build machine learning on artificial intelligence. And essentially it's AI that creates content. Generative, think of generative and gener generate as a sort of key here to remember. Generating new media, generating new content using artificial intelligence. And all it's essentially doing is it's predicting in a sequence of words, for example, if you're looking at ChatGPT, the probability of the next word being the next best word, right? So AI is all about probabilities. That's one thing that I think will be a nice segue to Trillium's question that she wants to ask about academic integrity. But all is it's all it's doing is saying, what's the probability of the next recommendation being the best one? And generative AI will create content. Non-generative AI will give you recommendations based on data that already exists. I hope that Trillium, from that, a really, really quick whirlwind. Um, I'm looking forward to your conference because I'll have lots of visuals behind me and it'll make lots and lots of sense uh, when we meet in December. But hopefully that will give everyone a bit of a flavour as to what AI is. It's demystifying it a little bit. But if anyone has any questions, then you know, contact me on LinkedIn or see you in December at the main conference. And I'm very, very happy to go into more detail there. Thanks, Priya. So what I'm, a few things that I took away from what you just said that maybe I'll just kind of summarize for our audience is that AI has come a long way um, in the last 10 years and especially in the last year, but there's still a lot more that's going to happen in the future. So as we think about our um, schools and our classrooms and our teaching practice, there's going to be continued innovation that, and that's why we have to kind of get excited about this wave rather than stick our heads in the sand. This is not going away, right? Um, and there's there's a lot to learn, which is exciting for sure. Um, are there any other panelists that want to kind of clarify misconceptions that they hear around certain terms that are used? I did a really good job, Trillium. <laughs> Apparently, yes. Okay, all right, then we'll keep going. Yay! I I the opportunity, but that's great. <laughs> So, so most of the focus today will be around um, the impact on education. There are a lot of other applications, um, you know, to this technology that we need to think about, but how is it going to impact our schools, our students, and our work? And so, as Kelly mentioned, one of the biggest questions we got, and a lot of the conversation has been around academic integrity and how we make sure that students um, as they start to use these tools, have um, a chance to continue to think deeply, but also, um, you know, what do we do as teachers when we're used to assessing students in a certain way? So we're going to ask um, first Andrea to give this um, question a shot and then maybe pass it off to Stephen if, if you would like. Yes, um, I think that um, addressing it or identifying it is really important, but in the bigger picture, if you think about integrity and uh, how students uh, choose to make decisions as they're answering questions or creating papers and all of that. Uh, it's really an inside job, right? And if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, then they're the ones actually that lose uh, the, the benefit of what they're supposed to be contemplating as they're responding. So um, I always think about that first. And then um, from there, Obviously, there are policies that are in place that make it really clear on what needs to happen when you're involved in teaching and learning. And explicit instruction around integrity and um, how students, uh, how, it, and if you know your students really well and you hear their voices, it's not rocket science to necessarily figure out if they have or have not responded appropriately to a prompt or an answer to a question. So um, I don't think it's reason enough ever to avoid uh, AI in school, which is a lot of times how schools behave, right? They wanna avoid anything that could challenge that, but we're in the business to create, hopefully, students that can think critically and who value honesty and integrity and who want to learn. And so if we've set that culture up and work in with that in mind, um, it's very exciting where we can go from there. Thank you. Stephen, would you like to add to that? I, I was going to pick up exactly where Andrea left off, and it's, it's the culture of the school that determines academic integrity. It's not the technology. And, um, you know, the strong belief is that the learning culture and the learning modalities and the opportunities that you have and the relationships with students 
um, are really, really critically important to a culture of academic integrity. I think this is a the the explosion of generative AI is a moment where we have to just rethink what we value in terms of what we're assigning, what we're teaching, what we're learning. How do we build these iterative cycles, lots of feedback and interaction with students? And in some educational contexts, that might feel more threatening than others. Um, but it's also a kind of opportunity to look in inwards into the school culture. Um, and some of the questions I can see have popped up in the chats around uh, plagiarism or AI detectors. And we already know that's come through the news a couple of times about how they can be quite unreliable, um, how they can also be biased against non-native English speakers, uh, learners of other languages. And so as we, we move into a space where there's potential risks associated with false accusations of use of AI or plagiarism, we really, really have to put our values first, put our definitions of learning to work, um, think about ways that learning can be more personalized. And that's, um, that's actually a pretty big ask for a lot of educational contexts, and it might feel quite threatening, but the other end of it is quite hopeful. Great. Thank you for those answers. What we're going to move to now, and I'd like to ask Nate to start us off on this question, is you know, what are the opportunities for using generative AI in the classroom and in our schools to um, accelerate learning? You know, we, we worry about all of these, these other things, but how can we use this? Um, when should we be using some of these tools? And what are some experiences that you've, you've had in your school, Nate? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, if I can piggyback on the last answer briefly, one thing I would also add, and it was said well about culture and knowing your students and relationships, I would say academic integrity in an age of AI should also include student voices. Um, so for example, we have a student committee at our school where we hear from them about what they, you know, what they're what they are using, what their friends are using, and all that. And I think when we wrote these policies, and a lot of us worked really hard on them what we think is like okay uh, for students to do and like what students are doing don't overlap. And so we have to have conversations and, and make bring those things together a little bit too. And so I would advocate anyone on this call uh, setting up a student committee, a student tech committee, a student focus group, uh, you know, please, please. I think that, that that's a helpful way to talk more, a little bit more about integrity. And then to your question about use in classes, um, I think my suggestion to all the educators on this call is, you know, aim high, you know, try something new, think outside the box, you know, really put these AIs to the test, uh, really try something different that you wouldn't normally do uh, and see what they can do and, and see what impresses you. So for example, you know, I have this linked in the resources you'll get to see, but when I had opportunity to talk to my colleagues, my faculty about how to use AI, um, I put some prompts in that I suggest might help them and one that uh, came back to me with lots of feedback about what was really successful is when uh, teachers would ask the AI to help them come up with analogies to help them explain what they're teaching to their students. And that sort of blew their mind. And, you know, if they were looking at, you know, if they had the AI develop, you know, four or five analogies to help their students understand what they're teaching, one or two of them would be amazing. It would be something they would use the next day. Um, so that might be something that might work for you. Uh, but I think it's bigger than just a, a single prompt or just lesson designing. Um, and I think the other side of this that should pull us through and keep us working on this is that when you do play with this, and I hope the educators on this call have, um, you realize its power. And so to think that our students wouldn't use it is naive. Um, and so we should absolutely be playing with this and figuring out what's good uh, so that we can then help our students with the AI literacy aspect of this, which we'll talk about uh, later. And we can start to see some of the problematic and, and areas where this, you know, this technology falls short. Um, and so the only way to really figure that out is to play with it. The only way to really figure out how it should work in your classroom is to play with it. The only way to think about how you should rethink your assessments is to first see what it can do. Uh, so you can you can guess what I'm asking you all to do, uh, which is, you know, aim high, do something different that you wouldn't think of, uh, see what this AI can do, and then backwards design from there. Great. Would any of the other panelists like to to weigh in on where you think it works really well. I mean, I know it's changing daily, but what are some of the tools that um, that you have seen work or that you're really excited about right now? Well, I, I can um, speak to using um, non-generative, I suppose, AI, essentially non-generative more 
right? Because it's controlled. Um, it's in a controlled environment in that the standards are there and what's what it provides you is with a very, uh, many modalities to reach students depending upon what their needs are. And um, that saves so much time. And it also allows for accuracy where instead of trying many different things, we can reach a student a lot sooner as a result of using Century in our classrooms. So I, th I think it's really important that Teacher, teachers are asked to teach, dif differentiate their instruction with the age and ability levels that are so vast um, and, and really and truly that's not possible in, in classes that arrive. And so this uh, tool provides us with a level of accuracy and efficiency so the teachers have time to actually build really strong relationships with their students. and. Um, tutor them and help them and push ideas out to them um, in a way that has been really effective. And our data actually supports that, um, that the growth that we have from last year and our first use of it has been unbelievable. So I think um, it's, it's the tool necessary for us to be more effective uh, with our students in that way. Thank you. And Stephen, I think you were going to add to that, correct? Very similar, but like I think something that really captured teachers' imaginations when ChatGPT exploded before was the ability to do exactly what Andrea was talking about. And then from then, the proliferation of tools essentially built on the same architecture. So, you know, tools like Magic School or Diffit, which is there for um, differentiation of materials and resources or things like perplexity where they can use GPT with search to do research and, and also then to work across languages, like the opportunity to use these tools in a multilingual classroom is incredibly powerful when you're trying to meet the needs of 10 different languages in one classroom in an international school. Um, I think that's what's really caught people's attention as ways to, to meet those needs of those students. And to give, like Nate was saying, just playing with things and seeing what the possibilities might be. But it's also why we see so many little tech companies popping up all over the place, trying to find their niche as well, right? So, you know, the more we play, the less we can rely on any single tool just in case. Yeah. That's great. Um, it's a good opportunity then to, to talk to Trisha now because um, Trisha has been giving a lot of thought to what a, what the implications of AI are related to accessibility and equity. So I'd like to ask you, Tricia, to speak a little bit on that. Um, you know, how can this help and how, how can this help students um, be better? It's a great transition question from what Stephen and Nate were just saying about you have to experiment with the technology to both see its capacity, but also then I think to understand where bias gets baked in. And I was glad to hear Nate bring up AI literacy because I wholeheartedly believe that it's going to be the learners that have cultivated the AI literacy that are going to be able to give that feedback to, as Stephen, you were mentioning, so many different companies popping up. Um, so I'm actually going to leave a link in the chat because this is a question that I could go on and on and on about. So I'll leave folks uh, with some follow-up resources there. But I think it's important to note when we're thinking about technology and accessibility, the World Health Organization just this past year gave some data uh, that suggests that it's estimated that 1.3 billion people currently experience significant disability. That represents 16% of the world's population. So when companies, you know, OpenAI, who are the folks behind ChatGPT, their charter statement says that their tool is for everyone, um, we need to kind of be seeing, okay, is it? How does it add an accessibility feature? Uh, and for me, a lot of my learning around this has been because of access to Twitter, uh, now being called X. There are a number of different hashtags. One that I have followed for a long time is hashtag inclusive tech. And that pointed me to a YouTube channel that's called Carry On Accessibility. Uh, the host Carrie is blind and she posts ongoing updates about tech and accessibility. For any of you that follow any tech-based news programs, if they are not covering accessibility, 
reach out to them and advocate for them to do so. Um, Carry On Accessibility is what pointed me to the iOS and Android app called Be My Eyes. And this is an app that OpenAI just partnered with this past year, where essentially with a phone, I can be pointing it at something, I can be taking video, I can take a photo, And now OpenAI has made the app free for a virtual assistant to describe what is seen in the image and then also for me to interact with it. So if I take a photo of the inside of my refrigerator, not only can I get information on what's in there, I can get information on what I could or should cook for dinner. Um, So there's, there's lots of examples like that. The link that I just shared has others. And there's one other that I just kind of want to mention very briefly, and that's an organization called Advocate. Um, it is a startup that is essentially going to make the process of claiming in the U.S. disability benefits more streamlined. Um, there's research that suggests something like 50% of, adv- uh, of applicants do not get their disability benefits in, ex- in an extremely difficult, time-consuming process. So Advocate is out there trying to streamline the process for applicants so that they can get the money that they need. Um, You can learn more about them at ouradvocates.com. So I think it's really interesting to be thinking about all of the different ways that this technology is going to be used for good. So again, um, I would check them out. They, They are brand new and I'm excited to continue to watch the accessibility in tech space. Wow, I just got my mind blown when you said that you can take a picture of the inside of your fridge and get ideas for recipes. That is like my big takeaway from today, Trisha. Fabulous. I love that. But it it just points to the idea that there are so many amazing applications for this technology that we're just starting to explore. And the ones that help um, increase accessibility around the world are the most important, I think, and, and the ones that we could spend extra time thinking about. I love that. And we look forward to hearing more from you um, in at our annual conference as well, Tricia. So now I'm going to turn turn the corner just a little bit, and um, we'll talk a little bit more now about cautionary tales. You know, when we're thinking about a, a thinking framework about when these tools should be used, where should we say this is not the place to use um, this kind of technology? Where should we be careful? Um, and let's see. Priya, we haven't heard from you in a while. Would you yeah. want to start with this question? I'm, I'm really happy to answer this. Um, I, you know, it actually ties back to that AI literacy point. I, I fundamentally believe that when we're thinking about all the opportunities and, you know, pictures of our fridge and, and recipes all the way to how AI can, um, you know, increase accessibility, how AI can help us in all sorts of really important areas of our life, um, how it can um, help us across education, health, all of that. Um, we always have to think about the risks and the concerns, right? And then we've got to try and mitigate the risks and the concerns. And so the only way, and this is the only way, and it's following on from what Nate, Stephen, and everyone said about trying things out, the only way in which you can mitigate from the risks at the pace at which this technology is accelerating, because whatever you learn today, and I don't mean to scare the, the viewers, but it's going to be a bit out of date in six months' time, right? So The only way is to be able to understand AI. You've got to be a better consumer of artificial intelligence if you want to be able to mitigate from the risks. So the best way to do that, Trillium, to your question, is AI is fundamentally made up of those data points we talked about, whether it's generating content, whether it's not generating content. And so the way you have to think about it is you have to be able to ask a question. What data is being collected in order for this, platform, this technology, this app on my smartphone to make that recommendation. What data is being collected for this persuasive technology? AI is a persuasive technology to lead me down that pathway. And that's a really good question to ask students in debates. I always say, ask them, you know, when it comes to social media and social media feeding news, isn't it really scary that a third of us across um, the world and particularly in the US and the UK um, receive our news from social media feeds and not from news organizations that and, and I'm not talking about news organizations that feed those feeds I'm talking about citizen journalism where you don't know uh, whether you can trust it or not I do think that fundamentally AI could create such amount of uh, sort of distrust in the world that it's potentially dangerous so to, to, to answer that question you have to be able to think about what is being collected in terms of the data 
Um, where is that data? Where is it coming from? Is it bias? You know, is it representative? Trisha was talking about inclusive, uh, being inclusive, but at the same time, a data set's inclusive because if they're not inclusive, then they're going to be biased and making biased recommendations. And therefore, whatever that app is, whether you're shopping from it, whether you're, you know, creating recipes, whether, and, and this is where it can be dangerous. Are you recommending a job for someone? If you recommend jobs for people and somebody says to me, I've got this great app, I've trained it on LinkedIn. The world has not been fair, right? Historical job data tells us that we have discriminated, right? Against women, against different race, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so if you think about the job recommendation, the career recommendations of children, and you think, what is the data set trained on? You have to be able to ask that question. And they will tell you what that data set is trained on then you are able to then think, well, is that a fair data set? And so trusting what comes out of an AI, um, the only way you can do that, Trillium, is to be able to understand what went into it. And the, so mm -hmm. think of the input, always split it into two. What is the input? So with generative AI, the input has predominantly been the internet, right? Which is why you have some class action suits as well around the, around the world, particularly in the US, about people saying, you can't use my data to train your AI platform. I never gave you permission to do that. What was the input to the to, to, to the algorithms and to the models that they've trained? And then what's the output, right? So split it in that way. And with education, you know, I think people are asking for a lot of tools, Trillium, really. like, what can I use? Um, again, playing around with it is really important because I always say, look, teaching is as personalized as learning is. When it, what the tools that suit one set of teachers might not suit another, right? And so being able to, be a bit brave and bold. You're not going to break it and you're not going to break yourself by playing with it. Promise, I promise you. So take a few of the resources that people are posting in the chat. This is the, the best part of this forum is the community I can see that is, is on the right on the chat on the right hand side. Take some of those resources, play with them and see what it does for you and then build that into your style of teaching and think, okay, how has this been built? What's the input? And therefore, what is the output? And just remember, I think so just one key point, we should, it'll be remiss if no one mentions this, so we must. Um, but you would have heard of the ability for generative AI to hallucinate. So when Andrea was talking, she was talking about a controlled environment. So classical AI is a more controlled environment. Generative AI has this ability to make things up. And so it's just always being wary that when you're looking at generative AI, when it's got an output, it can be very convincing. It can make up links. It can make up references. If you want to have a bit of fun, research the, the story in New York of an attorney who created his case and his entire brief in court using ChatGPT and didn't realize that ChatGPT had made up lots of references and cases. And he had to apologize to the judge. It was very funny. Um, but have a look at that. And then, yeah, Trillium, just be aware. Input, output what is the input right and a great way um agreeing with nate is the students are the, are the best voices here debate with them you know if these are the inputs what should we be thinking about because as they grow up they need to be much more discerning about what yeah. the inputs are in all of these applications yeah thanks trisha did you want to add to that I love everything, Priya, that you're saying. I, yes, very much wanted to add on to it because it continues with our theme of it's so important for students to be experimenting with these tools and to Priya's point about noticing when bias is baked in, a really great exercise to do with students is to look at the various tools and to notice which ones are making it really easy for us to report when we notice bias. Um, Adobe Firefly has a new AI um, text-to-speech image generator. And you know they, they have come out and they've said a lot of things about how important ethics are to them. And when you generate an image, you can hover on the image and flag it. They've made it really streamlined for students to say, actually, uh, there's some you know, very harmful stereotypes here. If I go over to ChatGPT and I prompt ChatGPT, how can I report bias to you? An earlier model used to give me an email address. I have been trying this out as the models update. And as of just yesterday, I wanted to make sure this is accurate for you. Um, I asked it and it doesn't give me an email address anymore. It gives me a few other suggestions and it says, you can go to OpenAI's website and visit their contact page. It doesn't exist. So I continue to kind of argue a little bit with ChatGPT 
And it kind of gives me, well, as a worst case, you can go to social media. So that's a really interesting conversation to have with students. Which of these companies that are saying our tools are meant to be for all of humanity are actually making it really easy for us to make a note when there is bias. And Priya, I love that you pointed out a real world case study because I think we really need to be pointing students to, you know, when we better understand algorithms and we better understand AI literacy, we see that this has real impact. So I'm leaving in the chat, um, this comes via Mozilla, who's a nonprofit organization. They do a lot of work around internet safety. Their game that you can play with students in about 10 minutes is called Survival of the Best Fit. And it shows how different organizations who are now relying on AI to help them sort through and do hiring, there's lots of bias that can be baked into that. Um, notoriously in 2018, Amazon tried this with doing their hiring and they noticed, wow, the algorithm, uh, the AI, was only hiring men and they were trying to figure out what's going on with our with our data set. They had disproportionately been hiring only men in leadership positions. So the AI noticed that. Amazon tried to tweak the algorithm and say, okay, we don't want you to do that. But then the algorithm was noticing uh, what they thought were gendered verbs or mentioning of uh, this applicant being on a woman's sport team when she was in university. So again, when we are talking about bias in algorithms, we're also talking about real serious harms. So I think a big part of our work as advocates is going to be students notice when we can advocate for more fair systems, more just AI, and notice when a company makes it real easy to do that, and then when they make it kind of complicated and very difficult to do that. Excellent ideas, Tricia. Thank you. Stephen, I'd like to ask you, um, I know a little bit about your school. I've visited quite a few times, and I know that you do a lot of work around student agency and student autonomy. And I'm wondering about your thoughts related to how this technology could impact um, that work. You know, some people have said to me, AI is going to make students lazy. So I'm just curious. I'm curious about your thoughts on that. Um, it's definitely not going to make students lazy. Um, I posted um, a link back into the chat there too, and to connect a few of the thoughts before, it's just the curation of some of our resources. Um, and conceptually first, I think if, if people in the call only read one thing to catch up on generative AI and what it is, I would say on uh, go to UNESCO and see their new generative AI guidance from about two weeks ago. And it, it goes in a few chapters and explains bit by bit what it all is, but it also has this policy guidance and included in the policy recommendations is one line. There's a whole bunch of lines in there that are super important, but there's one there about protecting human agency in the age of generative AI. And it really kind of sings to schools that exercise a lot of student agency as well, right? How do we make sure that we keep the data safe, but how do we also protect students motivation? So they're not being robbed of learning opportunities by the use of technology. Um, how do we ensure that there's as much social interaction as, as possible? Because that's what they're kind of craving for. How might the tools be used to minimize pressure, not exacerbate pressure when it comes to, you know, being hunted down for academic integrity or whatever? Um, and how do we keep talking? And when we talk to kids, they're not rushing to cheat. They don't want to use these tools to cheat and they don't want to give up the agency or ownership of their work either. So if there's low value, perhaps, in the work that they're doing, then maybe you'll see some chat GPTs appear. But actually, we had some kids talk to parents a couple of days ago, huge room full of parents, and they were describing how the our really fab library tech team in the high school had supported them using tools like Illicit um, to do academic research to support their extended essays and research. And they were proud of the work because they were being able to use the tools to find higher quality resources to do deeper learning. They weren't rushing into the space to copy paste from chat GPT. And I'm sure it happens occasionally, but that's, that's where the agency exists, right? But for schools, all schools, like we've posted a lot and we talk about it a lot and we're trying, you know, we're trying our best to create the conditions where kids can thrive and move on well, but all schools are learning. We're all just exploring in this space, right? 
Um, and like Priya mentioned, the, the pace of change is unreal. So we've got to learn alongside them. But we've already had students using ChatGPT for coding, for building things, for trying out new ideas, for translating their work. Um, but they also, and it's interesting too, when you think about the artists, they're really resistant to using generative AI. Um, so, you know, I have one in my house, she's a student and her friends, they've gone back to film cameras. They've gone back to paint brushes. They've gone back to all these different things to protect their own ownership of their learning. So I think we will find lots of interesting case studies about student perceptions of generative AI over the next couple of years. I love how so many of you have mentioned um, really elevating student voice throughout these conversations. I mean, we, the next forum, I think we need to have a student or two in our conversation like we've done in the past because um, they're thinking about this too. And we, we, we need to use the power of, of their thinking and their voice in our conversations as well, because it's, they seem to be a little faster at their thinking than, than people in, in my age bracket. Tricia? Well, I think one of the best questions we can be bringing to students right now is when and where are you noticing the assessments or the engagements where you are not interested in using generative AI tools? I think it's really important to ask them about it because, you know, Stephen, to your point, folks, SparkNotes has been out there for a long time. Uh, the, you know, encyclopedias, this idea of copy paste is not necessarily new. And it's really interesting to hear students talk about well, actually, when we are doing this task, I, I don't want to be using that tool or that resource. Um, I work on a number of podcasts and, and one of my co-hosts will say like, oh, you know, it's really interesting to ask a tool like ChatGPT to give you sample titles for the episodes. And I'm like, but I really enjoy doing that, actually. So I don't because that's you know, that that aspect of the creative process is one that really engages me. And I think this is a really unique opportunity for us to really hear students in advocating for the types of learning in which they feel completely engaged and they want that total ownership. And then to talk about when and where these tools can supplement that, because I think it's so important that we are constantly framing this as that tool is not more creative than you. You might be able to expand on your own creativity with it. But I think it's so important that students get that message again and again and again. The technology is not better than you. It is looking at you seeing your skills as potentially expanded and enhanced with some of this tech. I wonder if, if the emergence of this technology will finally shed light on some of our teaching and learning practices that need to be put on a shelf. Um, because this is our opportunity to say, you know, what type of learning experiences can we design that are engaging, that are for the future? Um, and some of the, the rub that we're having with academic integrity and rigor is based on an old model of thinking, right? I, I think, you know, you've all kind of circled around that idea, but let's embrace this as an opportunity to transform what education and learning could be versus um, digging our heels into the old style. Would you disagree? Would anyone disagree with that, Nate, or want to speak to that? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't want to disagree. I want to work off of a few things some other folks have said, which is <clears throat> the point about like humanity and student agency, the point about bias and ethics and equity, like those things should be written into our policy. And if it's not, if your policy is like narrowly, like don't use it if you're not supposed to, well, then you need a new statement. And I would, I get the way we wrote it is I would call that a position statement. And in your position statement, it should say that if we're going to use this, it's going to be for good quality pedagogical outcomes and that we're going to acknowledge the ethics and bias in it and that we're going to center humanity and relationships and agency. That should be written into your pol your policies or your position statement now uh, so that you can always fall back on that and make sure that you don't fall into the traps that, that all of my panelists have so astutely mentioned and pointed out. And then I'd say too, the other thing I wanted to add is as a teacher, uh, I teach AI literacy to sixth graders and they get it hundred percent, like no problem at all. I'm happy to help any of you do that if you're interested. Uh, I'm sure most of you don't teach sixth graders, but 
the point being like, we need to give them more credit uh, that they can pick this stuff up quickly uh, if, if, you know, if we frame it correctly. And then finally, uh, to the point that it's kind of coming up, I think, in the chat and in other places about, you know, differentiation and, and using assessments and, and all that. And I think, and whether or not this is going to, you know, AI is going to help enhance our students. And I think done poorly, it won't. I actually can make the case for why we're going to, we could have problems with AI, but I'm sitting here on this panel saying, if we get this right, it's, you know, we're going to see this explosion in our students' ability and their skills and how they can research and how they can write and how they can problem solve. If their teacher is not giving them what they need to, to, to succeed in that class, they can still go learn, right? Like, uh, you know, and the internet already sort of provided some of that, but AI is just, you know, putting that on steroids and, and unlocking abilities that our students have never had before. And so we have to open that door for them while also acknowledging all of these things that we're talking about here. And just like that final point, which is like, and we have to be careful that we don't normalize the like, oh, just do it from AI. Oh, just get it from AI. So it becomes this routine thing where students start to think that AI is great and like, oh, AI helped me with my class. Now, why don't I ask it a question that I should ask my parents or should I should ask my doctor, right? So then we run into that problem as well. So, so much of our work is around that AI literacy or that media literacy that a lot of us are talking about. Uh, but it's also keeping our eyes on how it's being used and why it's being used, how we talk about it, how we set it up in the lessons that we're designing so that it's something that we're constantly in conversation with our students about uh, so that we don't run into some of the, the negatives that are pointed out. And just if you're not uh, depressed enough about some of the negatives on this, we didn't get to uh, misinformation and disinformation being personalized and sent to all of us in endless feeds. Uh, surveillance of privacy, we glanced at a little bit, but that's major problems. Uh, you know, facial recognition, for example. We didn't talk about the environmental impacts of this. So there's plenty more uh, that we can do. And there's some space that we can create for these conversations so we can acknowledge the shortcomings while still holding this belief uh, that I hope I articulated in this answer of this can be a tremendous positive if it's done correctly. Thank you, Nate. Andrea. Yes, I just wanted to go back. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's been, I've learned a lot as well being here. So that's always exciting. But I wanted to go back to uh, some of the things I've been thinking about and what Priya said about looking at the inputs and what those actually mean. So if you're talking about generative AI, you're talking about it becomes, the AI becomes smarter as a result of the questions being asked and the inputs from everywhere and everyone. And so that that's a, one way that I think it's really important that students understand that it it's a culmination of their voice and everyone else's voice who's decided to input into that database. And so um, I think it's really important that we understand that in releasing AI to schools so that we can protect our, our students as they move forward in this um, new world that we're experiencing. So. And Trillium, really, just to come on to that point, I mean, it's really interesting that when um, ChatGPT was released um, in Europe, it was banned in Italy. I'm sure that some of you read that. It's now allowed in Italy again, because Italy said, actually, you breach our GDPR, our data protection regulations, you know, um, and the re how, how did OpenAI become available in Italy again? Well, OpenAI had to allow across Europe for people to write to OpenAI, to and Andrea's point, and say, I want to use ChatGPT, but anything I ask you, you cannot use to retrain your models, right? And so it's just interesting because we've got such a global audience here as to whichever country you're from, based on your country's data protection regulations, that's going to be what governs that input that Andrea is talking about, which is super interesting. And one of the exercises um, following from Nate's point, um, it sparked an idea Trillium that we did with um, some century schools was that we sat with them and said, the key thing to do here is to sit in your staff meetings, you know, when you're with your colleagues and sit down with a piece of paper, sit down with a laptop, whatever you want to do and write down um, what is the difference between HI and AI? What's the difference between human intelligence and artificial intelligence? And being able to articulate that in your own words. And then from the answer, flowing into a conversation about what you think education is actually about, right? What is learning for? Because if you can sit down and think about the fundamental purpose of 
why you're all there, why you're doing what you're doing, what the students need from you, what they need in the 21st century, given our curricula are quite outdated in some places, they don't feel as relevant. You know, you're often teaching children these 360 degree skill sets and this holistic education, despite the curriculum. Right? Um, but the fact is, is that there are many countries where the key strategy to pass exams is memorization. I can tell you right now, a machine has a better memory than we do. And as we age, ours gets worse. As it ages, it only gets better and stronger and more powerful. So what are all of those differences between HI and AI? And as Nate said, if you can have that conversation in the staff room and then have that debate in the classroom and say to students, you know, what is going to be a key difference? It's about encouraging agency. With AI, what we don't want is also another spoon fed. Here is what you've got to know. Here is how to use it. Here is how you don't use it. Here is a policy. Here's another policy. Here's an addendum to that policy now that things have changed, right? Having that agency for them to be able to think, I know why I as a human am going to be valued in the age where sixth graders understand where this technology is going, right? And having that conversation, and you know, on, people are always asking in the chat, what's your best resource? Your best resource are your students. Sit in a room with them and say, hey, kids, I've got a lesson plan to write for next week for Pythagoras' theorem. Can we all just get onto whatever AI tool you think you can get onto with free access? Write me a lesson plan. And what's so interesting is that Century, we do this for some of our schools where we visit. We're like, come on, you know, let's blend generative AI with non-generative AI and get the full power to empower us. And students love it. And they're like, you know, hey, Miss, I got this one, I got this one. And then they're quite excited about learning that topic because they've just helped to create the lesson plan. It's really, really interesting. So one of your best resources, as well as everything on the chat and everything that panelists have been posting as well, um, are your students because they feel um, pretty comfortable with this sort of technology. So help, you know, ask them to help you in a way um, and have those meaningful conversations about the purpose of why you're there so that people feel empowered as this is a tool. It's just a tool. It's just a tool. Um, but so that you know that you can develop those discussions with the students themselves. Thanks. So throughout the last 50 minutes, you all have given us so many great resources to think about, some great people to follow. Um, you've also given us some tips of things to do tomorrow, like what should we do right away? Um, so much to think about. I'd like to just ask you a little bit of a different question, if you don't mind. Um, we have today, in addition to our many, many outside participants listening, um, the entire NEASC staff in every single level of our organization are having a watch party today in New England. And um, this is kicking off a professional development, um, some professional development work that we're doing. And we want to know from you, if you don't mind, for everyone else, maybe you can also put some things in the chat, everyone else that's here. But what would you like for NEASC to do as an accreditor about AI? You know, what, what would be helpful for us, other than raising up these conversations throughout our network? What should we be doing as accreditors? Because we know we, we have an opportunity to guide conversation and to, to get schools thinking. You know, we represent a few thousand schools, both in the United States and around 90 countries in the world. And we know that we have a responsibility. So what are your thoughts on what should NEASC be doing? Anyone like to start? Yeah, Stephen, please. You're one of our NEASC accredited schools. Yeah, so uh, uh, two things. So I, I was thinking about this question and I thought, how might the ACE 2.0 learning principles and the four C's model of, of NEASC align with the with adapting to AI? So on the bottom of the link there, I've, I've done a little sketch up. Um, oh, but that's great. NEASC, NEASC has such a lot of reach and like, look at all the people in this call. And I think providing more opportunities like this and a library of resources and curated topics and just open conversations um, is mm -hmm. something really powerful. I think, because you've got such a reach around the entire world. And the, the second one would be when you're working with universities and schools as your as the agency that you are to mm -hmm. help make more connections from research to practice in classrooms in all different areas. But That's great. Yeah. So you let me real quick, Tricia. So you mentioned the ACE Learning Protocol, which is one of our pathways to accreditation at NEASC. We have other pathways to accreditation that different kinds of schools use. So I think what you're actually suggesting is that we look at all of our protocols to think about. And we'd have to do that quickly. Right. We'd have to do a, a quick 
um, rewrite of anything so that we can get things integrated. This can't wait for a year's worth of rethinking, right? It needs to be quick. So Stephen, I'm going to call you for the, some of that work. And I thank you for doing some of the pre-work for us. Um, Tricia, on to you, please. Um, I'm going to leave a, a book link. And I, I know I recommend a lot of books, but if you only take me up on one of my recommendations, this is a recent book from Meredith Broussard. Uh, the book is called More Than a Glitch. And again, it looks at where algorithms are being used and the influence that they have. They've got a story in there actually about the IB. So I know lots of folks here um, are coming in from IB connected schools. I think it would be great if NIAS could be a leader in terms of being very transparent about when and where you are using AI and what learning you are doing. Um, I think any organization that purports to care about children and society and education, be really transparent in terms of here's how we use AI in our hiring process, or here's why we don't. Here's why we advocate for AI for student assessment, or here's why we don't. It's been interesting to see how different media outlets are doing this. So, um, you know, AI is being used to report quite regularly in sports, in real estate news, and other organizations are saying, here's, here's where and when we are using AI, and here's where we're not doing so. So I think any organization, again, that has anything to do with education, now's the time to be just saying, here's where we use it, here's where we will not be using it, and why. That's great. Thank you. Any other panelists that would like to weigh in on what NIASC should be doing? I no? just want to go yeah. back to students, right, and student voice, um, which is part of our strategic plan and what we're really um, focused in on at our schools. And also, um, really look at, I know you have the uh, culture as a very important tool, but I think if you could relate that to the use of how you're considering artificial intelligence in your assessment and what that looks like, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Very good, yes. And I, I see a, a, something in the chat right now, which actually came through in a lot of our questions too about sp subject specific teaching techniques and maybe some, some groups around that to share different kinds of tools and learnings as we go. Nate, go ahead. Yeah, I think you kind of just said, you took the words out of my mouth. I mean, <laughs> Sorry. So uh, like, I like some of the things I've already said, so I'll just repeat them quickly, but one is helping schools develop that position statement that's more aspirational that includes some of the problems that we discussed today and make sure we center humanity, human intelligence, as other my other panelists have said. Uh, you know, AI literacy, subject matter for, you know, different age groups, you know, I, I can share my resources, but that one's good. And then finally, and this is what you were just saying, Trillium, so piggybacking on you here, a lot of us have read a lot of coverage about AI. A lot of us have seen a lot of screenshots of people playing with AI. A lot of us have seen a lot of demos for new AI apps. That's all well and good. What we are missing, and this is coming through in the chat right now, I think, is us actually doing and so my even this week, I, to the point on subject specific stuff, I was working on a the prompts and the lesson for a history department. This is high school history department uh, resources on using AI for the research process. And in the process of developing this lesson for this department, I, I blew my mind was blown by what this AI could do, and it made me totally rethink research and writing uh, for high school students, because I was playing with the AI and I was trying new things. Fortunately for me, I now have this space to talk to my history department colleagues to work on this. But anyway, I, I know we're out of time, but point being, we have to play with these and we have to find talk, time to talk to each other. Coming back to Priya's point about human intelligence, let's, let's see what this can do and let's do what we do best. You know, we're teachers, let's huddle up, let's see how it can work really well for us. Uh, and let's go from there. Enough reading, enough looking at screenshots, enough of all that. Uh, let's start to do and let's start to put our heads together and use our expertise uh, and AI together, uh, you know, to, to, to solve some of the problems we talked about in this panel. And That's two second it, point it, that adds to Nate's <laughs> is and, and share the impact. If you can share the impact, because that's why 2000 people signed up for this webinar is they, they don't mind the tool they just want to have everyone signs up to teaching because they want to make a difference to uh, students lives so if you yeah. can see the difference and if you if you can share that impact then it can demystify the entire fragmented sector and 
and hopefully people can use tools that they know will make that difference. That couldn't be more perfect, Priya, because we always focus on what is the impact, not the input. So if if generative AI is an input that we can use to our advantage, um, we need to know what the impact is and we need to try to try to measure that and adjust for that. So that's and non-generative great... AI and non-generative AI. Non <laughs> that's what I'm always going to be beating the drum about. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to pass it off here to Kelly in just a second, but I want to say my personal thank you to all of you for this fabulous conversation. And I hope that you'll all agree to continue it with us at different times in different places, because uh, I know we've just scratched the surface. You've given us so much to think about. And I think this is an exciting and um, it's exciting time for all of us in education. Thank you so much. Off to you, Kelly. Thank you all. On behalf of NIASC and all of our uh, representatives that were joining us today, thank you to each of our five panelists. I, I wanna just say, wow. Uh, I think we've gotten a lot of resources, a lot of key takeaways, but like any good deeper learning, I also have a thousand more questions and a thousand more points of interest than I did when we started today. And, so we'll be sure to mine the resources from the chat as well. It was a panel of five, but it was really uh, resources from, from hundreds of you today. So thank you so much to each of you. In the interest of uh, us being at time, we'll just say thank you and we look forward to the next time. <laughs>